There's nothing more unnatural than a nuclear bomb. Splitting an atom means tearing apart the very foundation of biological life, the building blocks of everything we see and touch. And the result is an explosion that melts entire cities in seconds. The world was captivated by the potential of nuclear technology in 1939, when scientists developed a way to split the nucleus of a uranium atom in half, a process that was sure to expel extraordinary amounts of energy. From then on, it wasn't a mad rush to build a nuclear bomb. It was a mad rush to build a nuclear bomb before someone else. The U.S. detonated the first nuclear bomb in the New Mexico desert on July 16, 1945. The plutonium implosion-type bomb exploded with the energy of 20,000 tons of TNT, and the blast immediately transformed the desert sand into radioactive green glass. In his diary, President Harry S. Truman wrote, We have discovered the most terrible bomb in the history of the world. Just three weeks later, on August 6, 1945, the U.S. dropped a uranium gun-type bomb called Little Boy on Hiroshima, Japan. President Truman gave the order. The next day, the casualty reports came in. 80,000 people in Hiroshima were killed immediately, and an additional 70,000 were injured. The vast majority were civilian men, women, and children. Three days later, the United States dropped a second nuclear bomb on Nagasaki, Japan. This time around, it was a plutonium implosion-type bomb, more powerful than the first. The blast was partially contained by the city's rolling mountains, but it still killed at least 40,000 people and injured 60,000 more. Just 150 of those killed were military personnel. It's unclear whether Truman actually ordered the second bombing. Nuclear weapons were new, and the world was just learning about their true potential for carnage. The day after the U.S. attacked Nagasaki, the president received a memo from Major General Leslie Groves outlining the next planned nuclear bombing in Japan. But this bombing never happened. After receiving that memo, Army Chief of Staff George Marshall hand wrote a response to Groves that said, it is not to be released over Japan without express authority from the president. Truman and the military wrestled over control over the nation's nuclear stockpile, as did presidents after him. However, the ultimate power to launch a nuclear weapon never left the president. It remains that way today, except now the United States has an estimated 6,800 nuclear warheads in its arsenal. As our foil in the Cold War, Russia also has a sizable stockpile, about 7,000 nuclear bombs. France, China, the United Kingdom, Pakistan, India, and Israel have a few hundred or less, and North Korea may have access to about 10. Of these nine nuclear powers, the U.S. is the only nation that does not have checks and balances built into its launch process. The President of the United States is the only leader in the world with the sole authority to launch a nuclear strike. Immediately after World War II, the United States was secure in its position as the only nuclear power in the globe. And then, in 1949, the Soviet Union detonated its first nuclear weapon. Tensions between the U.S. and the Soviet Union skyrocketed, and so did their nuclear stockpiles. Korea was caught in the middle of the Cold War nuclear arms race. The U.S. did not use nuclear weapons on North Korea during the Korean War, but it still massacred the region in a bombing campaign that killed one million people by 1952 and forced the remaining population underground. We decided we would try to starve the North Korean people, so we bombed the big dams in river valleys that uh, were flood control for their rice production. When the Korean War came to truce, the North Koreans basically were left without electrical power. North Korea has been scrambling to build up its energy infrastructure ever since. That's one reason the country is now going public with its nuclear capabilities. Kim Jong-un wants a seat at the table. He needs help, and he wants his energy and security demands to be taken seriously. Kim Jong-un is using nuclear weaponry as a way to communicate with the world. He's not alone in this practice. I don't know if you've ever seen the visual graph that shows nuclear weapons tests beginning in 1945, when, for example, the Soviet Union ran a series of tests. We immediately ran a series of tests in a few more than they did. And then there might be a pause, and then they would do some, and then we would do some. But there it is, countries talking to each other. Countries saying, don't do that, or I'll do this. I'm going to do this, uh-oh, you're going to do that. These pings of nuclear communication are, essentially, deterrence. Militaries around the globe continue to maintain, build, and design new nuclear weapons. The U.S. researchers today are particularly interested in shrinking the size of nuclear weapons and improving their accuracy. 
other nations have been experimenting too. The nuclear warhead North Korea tested in May suggests the country has an intercontinental ballistic missile, a weapon that could reach the United States. Meanwhile, terrorist organizations lack the capacity to build a nuclear weapon themselves, so their best bet would be to steal enriched uranium or an actual bomb from an existing nuclear nation. Considering even the US and Russia have worked together to help secure each other's stockpiles, Rhodes says it's highly unlikely a terrorist group will actually get its hands on a nuclear weapon. Instead, he and other experts say the most alarming threat in the world right now lies between two new nuclear powers. It's probably at least as bad between India and Pakistan, you know, who have the capability of not only destroying each other with their nuclear arsenals, but are capable, because they would use those weapons to burn down cities, of starting a nuclear autumn. Even with all of these moving pieces, the nuclear world today is shockingly stable. The entire Southern Hemisphere is free of nuclear weapons thanks to a series of treaties. The UN and other organizations are working to reduce the number of nuclear weapons worldwide. It's even possible to imagine a nuclear-free Earth in the near future, where deterrence is not a country saying, we have a nuclear bomb, but it's every country saying, we know how to make a nuclear bomb. Don't test us. Such a detente probably wouldn't last, but it's nice to think about. For now, nuclear nations will continue to communicate with each other in violent, global, radioactive blasts. For now, deterrence is the only form of peace.